Hello and welcome to the new European General Data Protection Regulation call. Throughout this call, all participants will be in listen-only mode and afterwards there will be a question and answer session. And just to remind you, this session is being recorded. I'll now hand you over to Mark Prinsley. Please begin. Welcome to today's, present, to today's webinar with presentations from lawyers from three of the Mayor Brown European offices on aspects of the new General Data Protection Regulation, which will replace the existing data protection laws from, dating from the EU Directive of 1995. My name is Mark Prinsley, um, and in, in today's presentation I will cover briefly the timetable for implementation of the new law. Guido Zeppenfeld from our Frankfurt office will talk about the scope of the new law, then Charles Albert Eliput from our Brussels office will talk about sanctions and fines and the new data breach notification regime. Oliver Yaros from our London office We'll then talk about compliance requirements, and then I will touch on the enhanced data subject rights. We will also cover the interaction between the GDPR and the current hot topic on international data transfers. We hope to leave some time for questions at the end of the presentation. So now, turning to the timetable for implementation of the regulation. As I mentioned, the General Data Protection Regulation is intended to replace and update the Data Privacy Directive from 1995. Proposals for reform were first published in January 2012, and virtually the final hurdle in the process was a trilogue negotiation between the European Commission, the European Council, and the European Parliament in December last year, which led to the publication of an agreed text for the regulation. All that now remains is for political agreement and formal adoption of the text by Parliament and the Council. A vote of Parliament is expected in February or March, and the Council approval will happen in, happen in January or March this year. The text will then be published in the official journal of the European Communities and apply two years following the 20th day after publication of the regulation in the official journal. The expectation is that the new updated law coming into force in 2018 will promote the EU digital single market agenda and as Commissioner Jarova commented following the trilogue agreement it's hoped that citizens and businesses will benefit from clear rules that are fit for the digital age but give strong protections and at the same time create opportunities and encourage innovations in a European digital single market. It's hard to imagine what that doesn't do apart from put a man on the moon but you should bear these objectives in mind as you hear our comments on the implications of the new law. Now I hand over to my partner Guido Zeppenfeld from our Frankfurt office to talk about scope and territorial impact of the new law. Thanks Mark. Well obviously one of the main objectives of the new regulation is to simplify the regulatory environment for international businesses by unifying the data protection laws within the EU. So one continent, one law is the objective. In order to meet this objective, the EU has chosen the legislative instrument of a regulation as opposed to a directive. It's important to note the fundamental difference between those two legislative instruments. A directive such as, for example, the current EU Data Privacy Directive, in principle, is not directly applicable within the member states. It needs to be implemented by the respective national legislators. In a directive, therefore, the EU is limited to set minimum standards only. Hence, there is a significant lever for member states to adopt national law, which goes beyond the standards defined in the directive. That's basically the reason for the current patchwork uh, legal environment on data protection. The regulation, however, is directly binding law within all of the member states. Consequently, this legal instrument has been chosen with the GDPR in order to accomplish the harmonization objective. Once it enters into force, the new regulation will therefore be directly applicable in all 28 EU member states. In principle, the regulation will render a single pan-European data protection law, replacing the current inconsistent patchwork of national laws. Companies doing business in the EU will therefore only have to deal with one law, not 28 anymore. Upon adoption, 
The regulation will also cover the member states of the European Economic Area, being Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein. Whether it will become applicable in Switzerland will depend on separate bilateral intergovernmental agreements. So, so much for the, for the principle. However, taking a closer look to the proposed new European data protection law, it is said that the harmonization is still insufficient and that the harmonization objective is jeopardized by numerous exceptions and references to member states' national laws under the new regulation. On the formal end, for example, the regulation does not apply to the processing activities for purposes of national security and law enforcement. Therefore, along with the GDPR, there is a separate data protection directive which forms part of the data reform package of the EU within these areas. Apart from that more formal exception, the regulation itself contains numerous references to member states' national laws which grants member states significantly way to maneuver in the implementation of its national data protection rules. In practice, therefore, that's important to note, the re these references and exemptions will mean that businesses in the EU will still need to closely look at the national law of the relevant member states in certain areas. Just to name a few of those areas, the EU, for example, the EU member states remain competent to define the legal requirements of child's consent. According to the principle stipulated in the regulation, the children below age 16 cannot give legitimate consent to the processing of their personal data. Member states are free, however, to lower this age to 13. So there is, a, there is a degree of uncertainty even under the regulation. Another very important area which I want to point out explicitly is the processing of employee data under the regulation. Member states and national laws and collective agreements may still provide for specific rules, for example, setting out conditions for the processing of personal data uh, in, 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 national, uh, in, in, in instruments of national law. And this is likely to be particularly relevant in member states where data privacy as such is a matter to consultation requirements with employee representatives, for example, the works councils in Germany. So uh, who is covered by the new regulation? The GDPR will apply whenever personal data about EU residents is processed in connection with the offer of goods and services or the monitoring of behavior within the EU. It is important to note that this results in significant change of the extraterritorial reach of the regulation. That is, not only will the regulation apply to the processing of personal data in the context of activities of a controller or processor with an establishment in the EU, beyond that, the regulation will also apply to processing of personal data of data subjects residing in the EU by a controller or processor who, which are not established in the EU. And that is an important change you need to take away. It's an important extension of the territorial reach of European data protection law. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so what's the material scope of the regulation? Basically, um, little has changed here. The regulation retains the broad definition of personal data as we are familiar with under the, under the current law. It applies to data from which a living individual is identified or identifiable by all means reasonably likely to be used for such identification. Examples are the name, photo, email addresses, or certain online identifiers. The current concept of sensitive data, which is a special category for which stricter collection and processing rules apply, is retained and expanded under the regulation to biometric and genetic data. Also under the new regulation, pseudonymous data remain to form part of the personal data. In response to the challenges of big data, the regulation promotes techniques such as pseudonymization and anonymization. One very prominent feature of the new European data protection law certainly is the one-stop shop. Now, what does it mean? With a view to provide businesses engaging in the same processing activity in several member states, the regulation established the one-stop one shop principle. Sorry, <laughs> Conceptually, this means that one single lead supervisory authority will be responsible for the supervision of these data processing activities. 
as a rule, such lead supervisory authority will be the one located in the EU member state in which the respective organization has its main or single establishment. Well, obviously, it will be key for organization doing business in the EU to figure out which exactly their supervisory authority is under that new regime. We expect this to be key for the organizations aiming to adapt to the new European data protection regime. One criterion which could help for the identification of the respective lead supervisory authorities certainly will be the location of the actual management functions relevant to the processing of data in the EU. However, the regulation still leaves considerable degree of leeway for the data protection authorities of other member states to declare themselves competent based on where the main processing activities are carried out or where the main decisions on processing are taken, are taken in practice. And that is, opens a kind of a gray area gearing up for the new regulation. From a German perspective, I should add that I would anticipate the German data protection authorities to push for their competences as lead supervisory authority. In order to address the situation, a situation in which multiple data protection authorities may disagree with one another, the regulation stipulates a detailed structure under which the national data protection authorities are to liaise and cooperate with each other. Furthermore, the regulation institutionalizes a so-called European Data Protection Board, EDPB, equipped with legal personality. The purpose of this board is basically similar to that of the current Article 29 Working Party. The board will provide guidance and opinions aiming to ensure the uniform application of the new EU data protection principles, as well as on the interpretation of the regulation itself. The board will be comprised of representatives of the national EU member state supervisory authorities and representatives of the EU Commission. So much for the scope and territorial impact. And with that, over to Charles Albert in Brussels to talk about sanctions. Thank you, Guido. So let me indeed, before we, we dig further into uh, the formal content of the, the regulation, let me quickly guide you through what will happen if things go wrong. Um, so, and the topics I would like to cover, so it's indeed the sanction first and the um, data breach notification afterwards. And really the aim uh, of, this two sec of those two sections is just to figure out whether the new uh, regulation brings data protection to a very serious matters or whether it's something you can just uh, listen for your own education, but that you can quickly escape and forget after this call. I'm afraid data protection is already uh, something which is very significant in a number of European countries, uh, France, Germany, just to name uh, a few, uh, where you even have uh, already some criminal offense if you don't comply with some of the rules, especially in the employment uh, context. Uh, with the new regulation, we will get in even more into a, a world of, of sanctions and a big monetary uh, uh, impact because really the, um, the regulation goes for stricter rules uh, in case of, of non-compliance. In um, the long process for adoption, there has been a lot of public debate and, and many of, uh, of us have heard about the monet monetary sanctions, so uh, whether it will be 10 million, 20 million, 2% uh, of the worldwide turnover or 4% of the uh, worldwide turnover. We had some surprise on those aspects with last minute change in position uh, and consensus uh, obtained on rather higher amount than what uh, were, was initially expected. But although those monetary sanctions are very important, uh, we should all remind ourselves that it's only one uh, piece of, of, the, of, the sanction, of the sanction and that many other aspects are, are relevant. So let me uh, go uh, one by one and first uh, focus on the uh, coercive powers that DPA will get under the uh, regulation um, because you will see that those powers uh, probably means that you will have more interaction with, with your DPA and that they will come more proactively uh, to data controller and processor 
um, in case of non-compliance. So if we start with a kind of low end of the spectrum, um, the uh, regulation provides that, of course, DPA can issue warning to controller or processor. Um, a warning is only a warning, but when um, you receive some, you probably uh, start getting uh, to dig into, uh, into it because if you don't comply or are not taking that seriously, you will go to uh, the next level, which is uh, an order to controller or processor to bring some processing into compliance um, with, the, uh, with the regulation or, uh, as we will touch upon in a second, uh, require controller to communicate data breach to data subjects if you fail to do so or you consider that you didn't have to do so because you, me you consider that you uh, meet some of the uh, exceptions. What the DPA will also be able to do is to suspend some data flows to recipients in third countries or to some international organization. That is, of course, something that is particularly relevant in today's discussion uh, with the uh, uh, end of safe harbor as we know it. Uh, of course, uh, that is very relevant and we'll hear Guido uh, talking uh, much more on, on that point later on. Uh, and then in the end, uh, Article uh, 53 of the regulation provides that in addition to those uh, polite warning up to suspension, the uh, DPA is also able to uh, impose administrative fines and those fines can, go, can, can be imposed in addition or instead of the uh, measures that are just described. So you can have a kind of double pay, so to speak. Um, what is also important to keep in mind, and uh, you will realize that when we go uh, into uh, more in details into uh, the administrative fines, is that there will also be a role for the EPDB uh, as they will be responsible for drawing up guidelines in the way uh, fines are imposed, and that's probably something that many people will, uh, will be happy with because um, that hopefully would avoid uh, to leave too much discretion on member state or DPA uh, level and provide some, um, some kind of guidelines on how those uh, sanctions need to be applied. What is still not harmonized and will be uh, kept at member state level is the setting of penalties. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's already the case in some countries that you have a criminal offense if you, you infringe some of those, uh, some of those. Um, so let's now uh, dig into the uh, administrative fines. And before we go into the numbers, uh, it's important to uh, keep in mind that Article 79 of the regulation in first instance provides for a framework for those fines to be imposed. And when you read through uh, the first paragraph of Article 79, you quickly realize that um, those fines will be imposed for uh, a very good reason, uh, because the Article 79 provides that those fines need to be effective, proportionate, uh, but even more important, dissuasive. So um, even if the DPA has some discretion, uh, it probably means that they will go uh, quite actively and, and try to impose fines that are really painful for, for business. What is also provided for in, um, in Article 79 is that the fines will need to take into account the nature, gravity, and duration of infringement, the inten intentional or negligent character of the controller or processor, uh, the repetition of infringement, and also uh, whether the controller of processes processor have adhered to a code of conduct or uh, went through some certification mechanism. That probably means that uh, when you try to mitigate uh, the exposure, you better uh, take proactive steps uh, even before things go wrong uh, to make sure that you adhere to such code of conduct or go through a, a certification just to uh, demonstrate and showcase to the authorities that uh, you were willing to be compliant if, even if something goes wrong afterwards. Um, let's now quickly go through uh, the, the level of fines. Um, we have indeed two levels of fines. Um, the one uh, 
that is probably the most uh, shocking. So is, is of course the higher one, so which will apply in six uh, cases that are very well defined. Um, and in case you do something wrong on really the basic principle of the uh, processing, so something like data protection principle, the legal grounds for processing, or if you uh, are messing up with, with consent, if you are uh, infringing things um, that are touching on data subject rights, that's Article 12 to 20 of the regulation, and uh, Mark will be talking about uh, those and then right in, in a minute. Uh, or if you fail to comply with data transfer properly, uh, or if you are dealing with sensitive processing or, or messing up sensitive processing, something like um, if you are messing processing with a national identification number or in the employment area, or even if you fail to comply with some DPA orders, um, limiting some processing or suspending data flows or just asking you to do something and that you uh, uh, are not willing to comply, then you will be up to the um, more severe level of fine and that can go up to the higher of 20 million euros or 4% of the total turnover of the preceding um, financial year. That is the uh, most popular or the, 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 the monetary terms that have been uh, given much of attention, but it's also important to keep in mind that lower um, level of sanction are also applicable for other type of infringement. And even if they are lower, they are still very relevant because uh, we are speaking here of threshold uh, of around 10 million euros or 2% of the uh, worldwide turnover uh, also for the preceding financial year. So that was for, for sanctions. Uh, now let me quickly go through the second aspect um, that will also impose uh, some burden on, on, on business is the disclosure uh, regime, which is which will happen in case of, of data breach. So the context of that is well known. Um, of course, it, it, it comes in a context where the security of processing has received a, an increased uh, scrutiny from, from authorities, and that's probably also because of data leakage uh, that uh, have come uh, into the public debate. That means that uh, everyone and every stakeholder is now very sensible about uh, data security, and also there is an expectation that if something goes wrong, um, you disclose that and, and try to fix it. Uh, in the regulation, the uh, disclosure will come in case of what is called a personal data breach. We have a definition of that, um, and that is a breach in security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure or access to personal data that is either transmitted, stored, or otherwise processed. So it's very broad definition um, that, uh, of personal data breach. And if that goes wrong, then uh, you will need to do something. And you will need to do something, and that something will be uh, different if you are a controller or a processor. If you are a controller, you will be required to notify the uh, relevant DPA and you will need to do that without uh, undue delay and where feasible uh, not later than 72 hours after having become aware of it. Uh, what is interesting is that that 72 hours uh, deadline uh, can sound as uh, something that uh, uh, you have already heard about it, certainly if you are uh, in the US because uh, for cybersecurity, uh, disclosure in the U.S., you also very often uh, find that 72 hours uh, notification or, or window. So it's something that should be fa uh, familiar. For uh, processors, you don't have the same deadline, and you don't have uh, neither a requirement to, dis to disclose to a DPA. Um, processors will only be required to notify data controller if something goes wrong and they will have to do that without a due delay, but not within a very prescri prescribed uh, framework. What is uh, interesting is that the regulation provides uh, quite detailed information on uh, what will need to be disclosed, 
Um, and if you are interested to uh, have a look at that, you need to go to Article 31 of the regulation uh, to see that, of course, you will need to disclose to the DPA the nature of the data breach. And that includes the categories and approximate, approximate numbers of data subjects concerned for the DPA to assess whether it's uh, a serious breach or, or just to have an idea of the, of the scope and breadth of the, uh, of, the, of the breach, and also the categories and number of data records that are concerned. You will also need to communicate the name of your, your DPO, uh, so Data Protection Officer, or a contact point for the, for the DPA. And uh, more important, you will have to describe the consequence uh, or likely consequence that the data breach could have and the measures that you are taking, uh, are taking to mitigate those consequences for data subjects. All in all, in addition of that, of that disclosure, you will also have to maintain your own record uh, because you could be faced with some requests later on from the DPA uh, asking you to, to demonstrate that you have taken all reasonable steps uh, to uh, do the uh, disclosure as you should have done. Um, then, of course, a big question is whether you will also have, as a data controller, to communicate to data subjects, because um, if that's the case, it will uh, lead to very big uh, disclosure uh, to, to, the, to the wider public. Um, the regulation is relatively business friendly in that respect, because um, it only requires a notification to the data subject by data controller if a personal data breach is likely to result in a high risk for the rights and freedom of individuals. But um, the uh, provision goes further on with some carve out, um, and you will not be uh, required to do that if you, ha you uh, have taken the appropriate technical and organiz organizational measures or if uh, it's not likely a high risk due to the measures taken by the data controller. That doesn't mean that you will not be required to do anything, uh, but at least that will save you the requirement to go to each and every data subject. Uh, in any event, it's expected that you will uh, have to disclose to the public and communicate widely to make sure that uh, the breach is known. And with that, I hand over to Olivier to go further on on the compliance requirement. Thanks very much, Charles. Uh, just before we go into that, I want to read out, uh, for those of you that are collecting CLE or CPD credit, the relevant numbers for you to write down. So please have a pen handy. The CPD code is C for Charlie, D for Doris, P for Peter, forward slash, M for Mayor, B for Brown, I for Indigo, L for Lima. The CLE code is N for Norman, R for Robert, 1, 2, 0, M for Mayor, B for Brown. So, um, the next part of our webinar is to focus on the, re the compliance requirements that are set out in the GDPR. And there are a number of those, but we wanted to focus on three very important points. The first is the record keeping and impact assessments that organisations will need to conduct to make sure that they are conducting processing of personal data in compliance with the GDPR. The second aspect is the question of whether it is necessary for organisations to appoint a data protection officer and what their role will be. And the third point that we wanted to address is the role of the data processor, their obligations and a data controller's obligations to ensure that their processes comply with the law. So taking the first point, which is the record keeping obligations, controllers and processors will now be subject to increased record duties of the processing that they are both conducting. Simply put, controllers and processors must both maintain records of the processing activities that they are responsible for. And in particular, where they are going to be conducting processing, which is likely to be high risk as far as the privacy rights of the individuals concerned, the controller must conduct an assessment 
of the impact of the envisaged uh, processing on those uh, individuals' rights. And that is what is known as a data protection impact assessment. Now, as I said, an impact assessment has to be carried out if processing is likely to be high risk, but it certainly has to be carried out if in three situations, and those are where there's a systematic extension evaluation of uh, personal aspects of individuals concerned based on automated processing. So profiling is a, is a good example of that. So where that is taking place, organisations, a controller will need to conduct a data protection impact assessment. Where a data controller is going to be processing sensitive personal data, for instance, information about criminal convictions or offences, or sexual orientation or race, uh, or medical history, again, a data protection impact assessment will have to be carried out. Finally, if there's systematic monitoring of uh, public uh, areas on a large scale, for instance, CCTV cameras of public squares or public spaces, a data protection impact assessment will need to be carried out there. And the, the impact assessment will need to include a description of the processing operations that the controller is carrying out and the purposes for the processing, an assessment of the necessity and proportionality of the processing operations concerned, an assessment of the uh, risk to the privacy rights of the individuals concerned, and the measures that are going to be taken to address any of those risks, including the security measures that the controller will take to protect the personal data being processed, the mechanisms that they are going to be using to demonstrate compliance with the GDPR, taking into account the rights of the individuals concerned. So it's going to be necessary for controllers to think very carefully about the uh, processing of personal data that they are conducting and to document it. In particular, where, where uh, processing is going to be high risk uh, in the absence of any mitigation measures that are going to be taken, the controller is going to have to consult with the data protection authority that is responsible for their processing. And that's something that is very important to note, uh, because the data protection authority, once it has received information about high risk processing that might be taking place, will then have the ability to come back to the controller and say, actually, we don't want you to be doing this processing unless you're going to be taking the following additional measures, or will also have the right to make further inquiries. So really, the, the purpose of this requirement is to discourage or to make controllers think very carefully before they actually process personal data that is going to fall into the high-risk category. And if they are going to do that, to make sure they think very carefully about how they're going to do it and that they have consulted with the Data Protection Authority before they do so. <clears throat> so that's the first aspect. The second aspect is the requirements to appoint a data protection officer. And there's been much uh, discussion uh, as the drafts have been uh, changed over time as to whether this was going to be a mandatory requirement or not. <clears throat> and you won't be surprised to hear that there has basically been a fudge on that point. So. Uh, it won't, will not be mandatory for all controllers and processors to appoint a data protection officer, <clears throat> but those controllers and processors that carry out certain types of processing will have to appoint a data protection officer. And those are those controllers and processors that um, process sensitive personal data on a large scale, or those that conduct processing that entails regular and systematic monitoring of individuals on a large scale, or those that process personal data as a public authority or body. <clears throat> so the likelihood is, is that most large and medium organisations will have to have a data protection officer. In fact, many large organisations have a data protection officer that sits as part of a data protection office. <clears throat> um, uh, so that is an important thing to note. And the, the GDPR includes a number of requirements that the uh, data protection officer has to comply with. <coughs> so the most important of those is that the DPO uh, 
has to act independently, mustn't receive instructions regarding the exercise of his or her tasks, and shouldn't be dismissed or penalised for performing his official or her official tasks. <coughs> so in the independence of the DPO is absolutely critical uh, under the GDPR. The, the DPO must have expert knowledge of data protection law and practice, they must report to the highest management level of the organisation. They must report directly to the, to the highest management level. Uh, they have to be the contact point with the relevant data protection authority that has responsibility for the processing being conducted by the organisation. And they have to have their contact details published so individuals can contact uh, the DPO. They also have a role within the organisation of making sure that the organisation is informed of its responsibilities under the GDPR and that compliance with it is, is monitored and that uh, the appropriate uh, responsibilities are assigned. They have to raise awareness and make sure that appropriate training and audits are conducted. <clears throat> they must also advise on and monitor the carrying out of the data protection impact assessments. So it certainly is a, a proactive role that the DPO is supposed to take within the organisation. The final point that I wanted to cover uh, in this webinar is the responsibilities of the data processors. Now, um, data processors will now have direct responsibilities to comply with the uh, certain aspects of the GDPR as well as the obligations that they have to data controllers under contracts with them. So now data protection authorities will be able to take direct uh, enforcement action against data processors for breaching its obligations under the GDPR and also for acting outside or contrary to the instructions that it has got from the, the data controller concerned. Processors will be held accountable for ensuring that they have appropriate security measures in place and that the way in which they're processing personal data is appropriately documented. Importantly, processors must now also obtain the prior consent of the controllers concerned before they can engage sub-processors to process personal data on behalf of those controllers. Um, importantly, controllers must ensure that they only use processes that provide sufficient guarantees on protecting personal data from a security and other points of view. There are a list of contractual requirements that controllers must make sure that processes agree to comply with in the GDPR and they concern confidentiality of personal data, transfers of personal data, audits, and there are other requirements that controllers have to make sure are in place with their contract with the processor. In certain circumstances, controllers and processors may be jointly liable to the data protection authorities for certain aspects of data protection compliance. So clearly these new requirements are going to fundamentally affect the contractual relationships at every stage of a supply chain between data controllers and data processors. Uh, they're going to affect the negotiating positions and Controllers and processors are going to have to look very carefully at their contractual arrangements to make sure that they now reflect what is going to be required under the GDPR. So with that, I will now going to pass over to my colleague Mark to talk about the enhanced rights of the data subjects under the GDPR. Thank you, Oliver. The rights of the individual data subject will be strengthened in a number of ways by the new law. First, there's the clarification of what amounts to consent for the processing of personal data. This is only one of the grounds on which a data controller might seek to justify processing, but it's given rise to much debate over the years since 1995 as um, new forms of collecting data and processing data in a digital world um, have emerged. The regulation will provide that consent must be unambiguous. There can't be implied consent. This probably means that the data subject has to take some kind of clear affirmative action um, for consent, such as ticking a box in order to show 
unambiguous consent. There's a distinction in the current law between the nature of the consent required for what you might call normal category personal data and sensitive personal data, and that remains in the, in the regulation. For sensitive personal data, the consent must be unambiguous and also must be explicit. Where a data controller is relying on a valid consent under the existing law, which doesn't meet the higher standards of the new regulation, it'll still be enough um, to be a valid consent after the new law comes into force. So one piece of good news is that there won't be any need to have a wholesale re-consenting exercise if a data controller is relying on data subject consent for processing of personal data. And as I say, that's only one ground on which you might rely on uh, for, for, for processing of personal data. The second increased protection for um, data subjects is that there's going to be greater transparency in terms of what the data controller is doing with personal data. So the data controller has got to give the data subject more information about what they are doing. Um, the data subjects to be told about um, what data is being processed for and the legal basis for that processing. They also got to be told how long data is being stored for or if they can't be told that at least the criteria that will be used for determining how long personal data will be st stored for. In a sense that's all in line with the law as it is now. What is different is where the data controller relies on the legitimate interests test for processing personal data, it's now going to have to explain to the data subject exactly what those legitimate interests are. This removes a rather useful uh, flexibility which exists under the current law for um, the data controller to determine that particular unforeseen new form of processing is in his legitimate interests. Um, and uh, I think that what will happen is that um, data controllers will need to look at their privacy policies to make sure that they are in line with this, they, they cope with this new updated requirement under the regulation. At various stages in the evolution of the draft regulation, a series of symbols, rather like washing instructions for clothing, emerged as a graphic way of describing the types of processing data controllers might engage in. And it seems likely that this idea will be developed further over the coming months. So watch for interesting graphical representations of I share personal data or um, we store personal data. Uh, one point of particular note for businesses which acquire personal data from other data controllers rather than directly from the um, data subject, and that might be the case in a corporate transaction or in an outsourcing transaction, is that there's now a time limit within which the data subject is to be informed of the fact that, that there is a new data controller in respect of their personal data. Under the current law, there's no absolute timetable, although there is an obligation to inform the data subjects of the new data controller. But under the new law, data subjects will need to be informed within one month. This is clearly going to focus the minds of data controllers on obligations when they agree to transfer personal data between themselves. Data portability is a new right um, in the regulation which has received a great deal of publicity. The idea is that it should be much easier for data subjects to move their personal data, such as mobile phone account information, from one data controller to another data controller. In the end, it's turned out, as it's turned out, this right might be quite limited. It will only apply where the data subjects themselves have passed the data in a structured machine readable format to the data controller and that the processing is being carried out on the basis of consent of the data subject and in an automated way. As I say, it's probably very limited in its practical application, although it's rather eye-catching. For example, it's not going to allow loyalty scheme members to require secret methodologies used by a loyalty card data controller to transfer their points and secret methodologies to another loyalty scheme provider, which is one of the concerns raised when this, first, this idea was first mooted back in 2012. The right to be forgotten or the right of erasure is another um, uh, uh, new right which captured the imagination of people watching the evolution of the regulation. In many ways, again, it's just a repackaging 
of the existing principles of data protection law, which require data controllers to keep personal data for no longer than is necessary for the purposes for which the data has been collected. But what is certainly new is the obligation on data controllers who've made personal data public, such as perhaps Facebook or Google, who are faced with a request from a data subject to erase personal data, is the requirement to use reasonable steps, taking account of available technical measures and the cost of such technology, to inform other controllers who may be processing the personal data that the data subject has required erasure of their personal data. It's not hard to see how this could be quite an onerous obligation. It won't apply in a range of circumstances, including where the processing is necessary for the purposes of exercising the right of freedom of expression and information. It will be particularly interesting to see how this new right evolves and builds on the rights in this area, which have already been established through a decision of the Court of Justice of the European Court. Um, two further ways in which rights of the data subject have been uh, improved or will be improved under regulation are first the updated controls on automated decision making technologies. The data subject is given rights in relation to automated processing such as profiling in three different circumstances. Essentially the data subject is given a right to object to this kind of processing. The first example is where processing is for a purpose which is in the public interest, or the data controller says it's processing in their legitimate interests. The data controller can object to this processing, and it's for the data controller to demonstrate compelling grounds which uh, outweigh the rights and freedoms of the data subject to continue processing through this automated um, methodology. This won't apply where public bodies, perhaps such as the police or border control, are using automated profiling in the exercise of their public duties. Secondly, and at the other end of the spectrum, data subjects have an unqualified right to object to the use of their personal data in direct marketing by automated um, profiling or decision making. So this is likely to help people in the UK at least find a way to stop insurance claims farmers phoning them with automated messages about possible claims they could handle for them. Thirdly, and in the middle of these two ends of the spectrum, is a right of a data subject um, to, to not be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing or profiling which produces legal effects for them. So automated processing may be part of decision-making process, but it should not be the only factor if um, the data subject objects. This might be relevant um, in the handling of insurance claims or credit scoring. Interestingly, it doesn't apply where the automated decision-making is based on the data subject's explicit consent. So this is again likely to be a point businesses using automated decision-making will bear in mind when drafting their terms of business or um, marketing materials. Finally, um, there is another form of protection potentially for um, data subjects, which is around the idea of privacy seals, which are like uh, certification or quality marks, which are going to be um, licensed um, to uh, new bodies, or they could be private or they could be pub public, to certify that um, websites and data controllers handle personal data in a specific way and the uh, certification bodies will have the right to remove certification as well as to grant certification. So it's not hard to imagine that disgruntled data subjects will take um, the uh, administrative and perhaps cheap line of approaching certification bodies to try and get people's privacy seals removed. This may be like the way people use the Advertising Standards Authority or the Trading Standards legislation in, in the UK as a cheap and effective way of causing aggravation. Now um, I'd like to hand back to Guido who will touch on the interaction between the GDPR and the current debate on transfers of personal data, particularly to the US under, under Safe Harbour. <laughs> 
Okay, thanks. Well, so in this webinar, you've heard already quite a lot about the new EU regulation and its main contents and features. What we have not touched so far are the rules it contains for international data transfers, to be more precise, to the export of personal data outside the EU. Now, as you probably all are aware, this is a hot topic in the current agenda of transatlantic organization following the recent decision of the European Court of Justice taken on October 6 last year, effectively invalidating the safe harbor scheme. We will cover this very important case law and its consequences for data transfers to the United States, more particularly in a separate webinar next week. I think it's the 27th of January. Today, we will focus on the rules applicable under the new regulation for data transfers and disclosures to third countries. Now, broadly speaking, the existing legal instruments to ensure legality of transferring data outside the EU other than safe harbor are being maintained under the new regulation. What does it mean? Adequate adequacy decision already taken by the EU Commission will remain in force, which means the current whitelisted countries are to retain their special statutes. Also, data exports based on EU model clauses are recognized by the regulation. The current process, however, whereby transfers based on these standard contract clauses have to be notified to or approved by national data protection authorities is abolished, which is actually a positive development under the new law. Existing authorizations for binding corporate rules will remain valid. The regulation includes the current requirements for BCRs for controllers and processes, which currently is based on EU Commission decisions and guidance as issued by the Article 29 working parties into the regulation, so writes it into law. As Mark just explained, uh, the regulation also provides for the explicit recognition of certain self-regulatory tools such as privacy seals, certifications or codes of conduct. And in, in fact, the introduction of this certification scheme is a novelty under the new European data protection law. As a matter of course, consent remains to be a proper basis for data export in principle, which means that it's provided that it's given under adherence with the strict requirements for consent under the regulation. As we have already heard, consent must be unambiguous, specific, informed, and moreover freely given, which is in practice not easy to establish. But to be clear, the regulation does not address the current issues in connection with the invalidation of safe harbor. In fact, under the regulation, it's made clear that the new law, under the new law, that it's not lawful for personal, uh, not lawful, lawful to transfer the personal data outside the EU in response to legal requirements from uh, from a third country's um, uh, authorities. And that exactly was the was at the very was at the very uh, uh, core of the EUCJ's decision, as it uh, as it based the decision on the surveillance requirements by U.S. authorities such, such as the NSA. So, what is to be expected here? The legal situation as of today is still unresolved, and discussions are pending. By way of background. On October 16th last year, the Article 29 Working Party has called on the EU member states and the EU institutions to urgently find political, legal and technical solutions with US authorities to enable data transfers to the territory of the United States that respect the fundamental European data protection rules and the fundamental rights of privacy. Part of this solution obviously can be the current intergovernmental discussions on Safe Harbor 2.0, which are still pending. A deadline has been set for 31st January 2016, so only 11 days from today. According to the Article 20 now Working Party, the standard contract clauses and existing binding corporate rules can still be used until the end of the deadline. However, what will happen after the deadline is that the EU data protection authorities are committed to take all necessary and appropriate actions, which may include coordinated enforcement actions. So what does it mean in practice? It means, of course, that the outcome of the current intergovernmental discussions until the end of this month must be closely monitored. However, if no appropriate solution will be found by the end of this month, businesses engaged in transatlantic data transfers, 
will be well advised to liaise with the relevant national data protection authorities in order to ensure legality of data transfers to the U.S. Just by way of example, and I understand that the national approaches here differ. Uh, in Germany, for example, the national authorities, data protection authorities, can be expected to take particularly a strict approach. Reliance on safe harbor will not be an option anymore, and the German DPAs have all already announced that they will critically scrutinize existing data transfers on US, uh, to the U.S. based on existing model clauses or BCRs. So from a German perspective, liaising with the local DPAs will be important to figure out solutions compliant with the, with the, uh, with the, with the European data protection law. Those, those solutions could be technical solutions, for example. But I understand, as I said, that the approach in the UK is different. Right, Mark? Yes. So, so in the UK, we've got a classic UK approach, which is don't panic. Um, and I, I think that uh, the guidance from the UK Information Commissioner is um, a wait for the guidance, but um, that the model terms, for example, and other f forms of transferring personal data to the US apart from the now invalidated safe harbour should remain um, should remain in force, and it's quite possible that um, uh, the the deadline of the thirty first of January um, will get extended in any event. But I think that the UK approach is is far more pragmatic than um, uh, the um, pronouncements from 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 the German authorities. Um, should we perhaps now see if there are any questions from? Um, participants in, in, in this webinar. Could you, could you open the line, please? Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question at this point, please press zero 01 on your telephone keypads. You can press zero 02 at any time to withdraw your question, and there will now be a brief pause while questions are being registered. Again, just to remind you, if you would like to ask a question, Please press zero 01 on your telephone keypads. You can cancel your question at any time by pressing zero 02. And there will now be a further pause while questions are being registered. And our first question comes from the line of Lada Pressinger of Commerce Bank New York. Please go ahead. Your line is now uh, A practical question. Can you, can you repeat the codes for the Continuing, um, is there legal education um, certification? What was the code? You said NR120 or something, M, and what else? Yeah, that, that's right. NR120, M for Mayor, B for Brown. B, B, okay. Thank you very much. That was the question. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Bernadette Daly of Tommins. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Thank you. I had a question about um, the level of, of fines. Um, so I think there was some mention that it was, uh, I think I've, I've got down 20 million or a percentage of turnover. So is, which one is the highest? Is it 20 million or 4% um, if higher, or, or is 20 million the maximum fine? Yeah, so, so thanks. So it, it's indeed the highest of 20 million euro or 4% of world, worldwide turnover. And there is still some question, of course, on how you will compute that worldwide turnover. So whether it's turnover at consolidated group level of, for example, the worldwide turnover of the data controller or process concern. But to answer your question, it's the highest of 20 million or 4%. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Adam Creighton of MSCI. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the requirement to appoint a data protection officer. Uh, so if you have a large organization that uh, does not engage in the collection and processing of customers' personal information, but nevertheless uh, has a large workforce, so there's a, a significant amount of HR data, would that uh, trigger the requirement to appoint a data protection officer? Uh, yes, it probably will, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you. Again, just to remind everybody, if you would like to ask a question, please press zero one on your telephone keypads now. And we have no further questions on the line at this time, so I'll return the call to our speakers for closing comments. So I think at this point we'd like to thank you all for, for listening. We hope you got um, some useful information out of it, and um, we look forward to engaging with you uh, on future webinars. Thank you very much. This now concludes our call. Thank you for attending. Participants, you may disconnect.